Okay folks, we, welcome to the third instalment in this um, Terrible Fire card history series. Jumping forward a wee bit in, into the future, so to speak, this isn't actually my third card, but this is the Terrible Fire TF534. It's very much an evolution of the card, the previous card, the 530, so it made sense to do this one next. Um, and I thought actually as for this video I would actually <laughs> see if I could see if it would actually fire up. It's been in a drawer for must be four 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 years now, three or four years. Um and I haven't really touched it, but I did spend an awful lot of time on this card. This is probably the card I spent the most amount of time trying to get right and trying to make it work and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um differences from the previous card. So it's still got the O30 CPU, 68,030 CPU. It's still got the um, the uh, the FPU here, the uh, 688.82. I think the 8881 will work as well, but I'm not sure. I, I think the only time I tried it, it didn't. Um, the RAM chips have been changed to a four megabyte RAM, uh, so four megabytes of RAM. A surprising, <laughs> these chips jumped up in price as soon as I. As I expect them again, these were cheap before I started this. I think um, this is a 50 megahertz card. Uh, this particular one, it could run between 33 and 50, so you could just put the crystal you wanted on here. I believe I sold these on PC, through PCB Way, and I did orders of them in batches and sold them through eBay, and then I open sourced it. I believe there was a, a silk screen or an <laughs> early version had a published. Uh, typo on the silk screen. Uh, the terrible fire logo, as you've come to expect. Um, there's a slightly bigger CPLD on this one um, because I needed a couple more pins. Because what I did was I put this RAM, one of the things I did in, in this um, duration of the card was I put the RAM, instead of it sitting in the z in in 24 bit memory in the, in the space in, the, in that sl area allocated for fast RAM for the Amiga 500, I, I slapped it up, way up into the 32-bit area, uh, what's sometimes known as Zorro 3 space. It's not technically th Zorro 3 RAM, it's not Zorro 3 RAM, but it's it's not using the Zorro 3 spec, but it's in the space that Zorro 3 RAM would be allocated in, so it's Zorro 3 uh, configured, and it doesn't use the Zorro 3 configuration mechanism confusingly either, it's just in Zorro 3 space, using the Zorro 2 mechanism and and all these sorts of things. So the other thing I did with this is um, because of the the people had to, you know, as mentioned in the previous video, one of the things the lads were doing was trying. They had to solder this this header on their Amiga five hundred, and people with lower soldering skills weren't managing it, and they were managing to, to leave solder bridges and whatever. So one of the the the, the, the main features of this card was that it. It managed to factor out this this whole um, um, this, the need for this jumper wire, and the re way I did it was um, it, it the, the the reason for it is because when the IDE interface has got some in, some information ready and it wants to the, to tell the Amiga about it, it uh, it has to raise an interrupt, and in order to do that, it would have to set this pin here. The effect of that was that it would set an interrupt. And then it would set a status register in one of the custom chips. Now the way I got around this was quite sneaky. What I did was, when uh, setting the interrupt is fine because there's the interrupt pins is here, are here on the um, on the connector, so I can just drag them low until the interrupt acknowledge cycle happens. Absolutely fine. However, when it goes to read the status register, what I do is I allow it to go to. I think it's Gary that has the interrupt status register. I'd like to go to Gary and see that interrupt status register and it allow Gary to put that information on the bus. I then get the CPLD to sample that data, but I don't acknowledge the cycle to the CPU. I, uh, I then make it look like, allow Gary to, to think that the cycle has finished, to, uh, switch off the address select to the, to the main bus, and then I put that data back on the bus with the data that I want patched onto it. So I kind of man in the middle that um, that status register in order to make this work. 
uh, it kind of works beautifully and it's the same thing that's done on the on the TF um, 536 which we'll talk about tomorrow but I just thought I, I thought you'd like you guys would like to see it actually up and running that is it running that was the speeds I was getting out of it and back in the day um, 15 times the speed of a, a standard a600 and it's at 51 blah 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 I mean I haven't I haven't checked this is the most up-to-date firmware to be honest it's just what was in the card when it was put away so um, I'm kind of surprised it worked at all but <laughs> there we go we got something we got it running and so I, I think I got data cache off there but um, yeah I was able to to get some speeds out of it and, and the, the, you've got some uh, some floppy speeds there flops in flops as well so I thought that would be interesting other things that went on in this um, card it was the it was the um, that the card that switched from 44 pin IDE to sorry 40 pin IDE to 44 pin IDE and I was kind of a petition by people they wanted to just use this form factor this is the what they've been using this is what everybody wanted to use um, they didn't want the 44 pin there wasn't that many devices around that in Amiga land that supported it so there was a petition and also you had to find external power to, to power your IDE interface if you did that this has got the power integrated as well so there was a massive petition on one of the forums to get me to do this I capitulated and it happened and, and we went in and did it um, the, one of the design goals for this was to put an SPI ROM on here and put a custom kickstart on it now the SPI ROM I I, I I had um, there was a utility for the PC called Flash ROM, and I had um, patched Flash ROM to read and write that ROM, but I never got the functionality to make it work live out of running for the running CPU working. Um, kind of an exercise if anybody's really thinking of doing it. Um, like I say, these this was four megabytes of RAM. FPU again, and one of the things I noticed when I was I spent a lot of time testing this card. One of the things I found with this card is programs would wiggle the select lines of this during startup and then they would never do it again. So the programs that would crash, it was almost like they were compiled with the wrong options. They were expecting this to exist. They checked it existed, but then they never used it. And and, and sort of like empirically, empirical evidence was that this was not getting used very much at all. Like I could sit, you know, like maybe, once a minute um, in in some cases and it's just, it was not being used and that's one of the reasons it was dropped from the next revision but the FP sorry this is the FPU for for anyone who doesn't know this is the, the floating point unit and it's one of the reasons why I didn't continue with this this approach of having the two the, both the FPU and the CPU on the boards the FPU I just didn't think it was being used it was eating a lot of board real estate that I could use for other things I could use for more RAM and I just didn't think it was worth it. So this was the last time I put an FPU on a board. And a lot, and I would say a lot of people, but occasionally I get, uh, why, when are you going to put an FPU back on something? And I'm like, I'm not, it, it's not used. It's not used. I, I empirically check that a lot. Um, anyway, um, probably one of the things I did here that I thought was, a mis I think in retrospect was a mistake was to, to put a bus buffer on to, to drive the Amiga bus from this side so when I'm driving the Amiga bus I can I can um, you know it's to ramp up the voltage to get across the the um, potential bad bad contacts I don't think it really made any difference and I think that was just an expense something that added expense to the board that wasn't needed and there was a version of this with the with SATA the SATA bridge here Again, and, and I spent a lot of time working on that one, and I could never get it to work either. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that's, I think that's about it. I can just have a quick look. So, uh, you know, it, it's 50 megahertz. It can run 50 megahertz from 33 to 50 megahertz. I think we mentioned that. Flash ROM stuff. Bigger, slightly bigger CPLD. The SBI port again. It was, it was implemented a bit on this card, less so than others. I think this one got a lot of development time on the Atari. ST because it, it showed up um, some some issues um, but yeah I think that, that that's all she wrote on this one it's 
uh, you know, it was an IDE interface. It was very much an evolution of the 530 with more RAM in the Zorro 3 space. So it didn't clash with stuff in the, um, it didn't clash with stuff. Like if you put another, if you put another Excel, um, another f uh, fast run card underneath it, it would work with that. And I did test a number of them as well at the time. Well, the RAM bandwidth on that was very slow. Anyway, that, there you go. And, and surprisingly, the card still works <laughs> after all these years. So, um, yeah. So if you are, so, so, so there'll be another one of these tomorrow. If you, um, if you like what you see, uh, give it a like and subscribe until you get a notification. Okay. Thank you for watching. Take care and have a good one.